everyone, welcome back to my channel. I am Brit, and if you haven't subscribed yet, you probably should because I talk about geeky things, but sometimes I sit on my couch at 3.30 in the afternoon with a glass of wine, don't judge me, and I tell you the crazy stories about the reasons why I drink. As many of you may know, um, I have been an actor for a very long time. Uh, I have done a lot of voiceover work. I've done voiceover work since I was like five years old. I have also done stage work since I was, I mean, realistically since I was about 13, but my first stage show was actually when I was like seven. Um, but the acting bug really didn't hit me until I was 13. So when I did Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, which will be a few stories within this story. And at some point when I can find uh, a VHS player, VCR, I will um, grab my converter because I've got this converter where I can plug into my computer and I can um, put VHSs on my computer. Um, I will uh, react at some point to my scenes in Cinderella. Um, I was just a townsperson, so. But yet I have a lot of stories about things that make me just, you know, do this. Acting has been always one of my greatest joys in life. It has brought me some of the best joys in my life and some of my best friends and some of my greatest successes in life. Um, however, there have also been moments where it has caused me anguish and sadness and anxiety and depression. So there's that. Um, so let's go ahead and chat a little bit about some of the stories in which uh, acting has made me want to drink. So, so let's go ahead and start with my first show ever, Cinderella. So I got it. I decided to audition for Cinderella just kind of out of the blue. I heard the intercom at the end of school one day saying that there were auditions for Cinderella uh, starting at like four or whatever and school's out at 307, very specific number, but it was 307 that the bell rang for school to be over. Don't ask me why, you should ask Pequot Lakes High School why. I went to the same school building from K through 12, so I don't... When I say Pequot Lakes High School, I just mean the whole school because it just all existed within one building until my senior year of high school. So then that's when they opened up the elementary school. That's the point. Anyway, I immediately ran to the payphone and called my parents because that's how old I am. I had to use payphones. I didn't even have a cell phone yet. I didn't get a cell phone until I was 16. The only reason I got a cell phone at 16 was so that my parents could still contact me regardless of where I was and that was literally it. They, I was all of a sudden given a lot of freedom and they were like, here's a thing that you can only use to speak with us because we need to speak with you at any given point. Um, but yeah, so at 13 I was still using pay phones, so there you go. Anyway, um, so I ran to the pay phone and I called my parents because uh, my, my school had a few pay phones throughout the school at the time and I'm sure they've gotten rid of them. And I called my parents and I said, hey, I'm going to stay after school. And they go, why? And I said, well, I'm going to audition for the play. I'm going to audition for Cinderella because I didn't understand the difference between play and show at the time. I was brand new to the world, okay? Just leave me alone about it. They're like, okay, sounds great. Hope you get into it. And I was like, okay, cool. So I went to audition. I didn't plan anything. Don't ever do that. If you're going to go in for an, an audition, you want to do some research prior, especially if it's going to be a musical audition because I ended up just singing happy birthday because that is, I had nothing prepared. Always go with something prepared. It's a lot more professional. It's a lot less professional to go with literally nothing prepared for a musical audition. Um, I have depended on happy birthday quite a few times in my life um, because I'm not a musical person. I don't have anybody to train me musically. So that's why I don't do musicals anymore. Why I, if I ever go back to the stage, I will only ever do plays anymore because musicals are too time consuming, give me too much anxiety, I'm not a good enough singer for them. And number two, or and, and finally, I, I I usually depend on happy birthday and that's not okay. <laughs> Though I do sing like Marilyn Monroe apparently according to one of my college professors, but I digress. So I got in, <laughs> I got into Cinderella but when that happened, when whilst Cinderella was happening, a lot was going on with my family. And my parents actually split up opening night. <laughs> <laughs> my, 
my parents drove me to opening night of Cinderella together, um, and I knew there were problems. Like they'd been fighting a lot, they had been going through a lot. They're reconciled now, but at the time they they split up, and they split up for a decent amount of time. Um, I was in college when they reconciled, so that's how long they had been split up. But um, they split up that day. Um, so again, they dropped me off together uh, at when I was at my call time to be there to get into hair and makeup in my costume and run through some warm-ups and things like that. And uh, when I took my final bow, got out of my costume, and washed off that god-awful pancake makeup. Mm, hate pancake makeup. Um, that in itself is a reason why I drink pancake makeup. But once I was done and ready to go, my grandmother was waiting for me and said, you and your mom are gonna come stay with me for a little while. Needless to say, the journey through Cinderella was a difficult one because it was my experience of also my parents splitting up, the memory of that, the trauma of that. So looking back on Cinderella, I don't have a lot of memories of it because I have PTSD, which I didn't know until just last year. Um, but I... <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I don't have a lot of memories because when you have PTSD and you go through a traumatic event, a lot of times you dissociate and a lot of times you forget those things. And those memories of seventh grade are very, very gone. Very, very gone. Um, I can't even tell you half of the things that happened in seventh grade and the only things that I can tell you were all very traumatic events. Like when my life was threatened, which I talked about that in a video. <laughs> um, so a lot of my memories of seventh grade are gone, especially that. I remember some things, like I remember having a crush on my friend Jake, who was also in the show. I had the biggest crush on him and Jake, if you're watching this, because we're still somewhat friends. I don't know if you watch some YouTube videos. I mean, we're, we're still friends, but like, we're not friend friends. Like we, you know what I mean? Like we're high school friends that still chat from time to time. I went to his brewer, his wife's brewery or his brewery. He owns it with his wife, uh, not brewery, cidery up in Duluth. Um, you guys would have seen that in a vlog many, uh, a long time ago, back when I went to my cousin's um, sex reveal party for her child. But I had this this big crush on him at the time, just the biggest crush on him, and I knew that he was dating this other girl that was in the was in the show with us, was in Cinderella with us, and so anytime they were chatting off to the side, I would go and spy on them. I was caught once and they laughed at me and yelled at me. Um, yeah, so that was that. I was a very, I was very creepy when I had a crush on boys in high school, in middle school and high school. Like, I was very creepy about it. <laughs> I would watch them. <laughs> Sorry to literally everybody that knew I had a crush on you in either middle school or high school, because I would constantly watch you. So there's that. Actually, there's only one person I had, I, I had crush on basically through all of high school. I told that story too. Um, anyway, but the crush on Jake really faded during that time. That's again, only something I vaguely remember. Another thing that I remember was having gone, going, I was going through this bout of depression. It was one of my first experiences with depression. And um, one of the things that, that I experienced while going through this depression was, um, poor hygiene practices. Um, I stopped showering. I stopped wearing deodorant. I stopped brushing my teeth for a very long time. How I still have teeth is beyond me. Let's be real. Um, but according to one dentist, I have some of the best roots ever. So genetics. Um, anyway, uh, so I was in a place where I just wasn't feeling very good. And what was really unfortunate was nobody really understood that I, th uh, I think understood what I was going through. I was watching my parents argue. Um, I have terrible memories of that. And just feeling scared and feeling unsafe, which again, when you have PTSD, you're constantly feeling unsafe. And so because I had PTSD and nobody knew it. There was no way for me to be treating it at the time. Um, and I was constantly feeling unsafe because my parents were so unstable that nobody really knew how to take care of me. Um, instead, I was shamed for this lack of hygiene 
because everybody was assuming it was a choice. It was an active choice that I was making. Um, when in all reality, I was a 13 year old who was struggling with depression and struggling with what was undiagnosed PTSD. And I was shamed and traumatized further because of it. Um, so anybody who does do directing or producing of, of shows um, and you are working with teenagers, try to keep in mind their personal lives at home. Instead of shaming them, instead of going up to them and basically giving them deodorant or forcing them to have deodorant or forcing them into the gym shower because they stink, um, maybe have a sit down chat with them first and ask what's going on? Is there something that I can help you with? Because I think that would have dramatically changed how I felt. I think that would have dramatically helped me kind of go get through that and process that a lot better if I had somebody to talk to. But at the time, I really didn't have anybody to talk to. I was seeing the school therapist, but we talked about that in another story time. Um, it was a nightmare and I didn't have anybody to help me. And I think it would have been very, very helpful to have somebody just sit down with me and ask me what's going on, what's happening. Why is it that you're feeling this way? And I would have really appreciated that. So keep that in mind if you're a director or a producer of shows. Just if you're working with teenagers, especially teenagers because of how many hormones are ru rush rushing through their bodies at any given time, their home life could be playing a huge part in why they may not be showering or wearing deodorant or going through something. Um, so just keep that in mind. That was really hard for me and it really sucked. All in all, Cinderella was a pleasant experience from what I remember. I look back on it fondly. Um, I remember looking back on it and having really good friends. I never stayed in contact with any of them. I ran into some of them in future auditions, but I never really stayed in great contact with any of them and I hope they're all doing well. Moving on, Riders to the Sea was the next show that I did, or the next play, it was a play that I did. It was a one act play. Um, and that story was actually kind of cool. Um, I was originally cast, again, as kind of a background character. More than anything, I had like one or two lines um, during the play itself. And we were doing two one act plays. So uh, my school, what we would do is if we did one act plays, we would do two of them and they'd be, uh, the first one and then they would have um, an intermission and then they'd come back and do the second one act play. Um, and so that was how my school kind of did it unless they did like a full play uh, where they would do an, a true intermission in the middle of the, of the show, of the play or the show. Um, but in a lot of cases we did just one act, two one act plays. So Riders of the Sea was one of those one act plays. And it just so happened that the person that was in the other play, um, which oh, I love that play. I would love at some point to get permission to do that play because I love that play so much. And it actually hits home because it's about somebody who is dissociating uh, with PTSD after going through a traumatic event. And honestly, and, it, and it's not about war or soldiers it's about just a regular person who went through a traumatic event and now that i have understanding of it like i never understood why i related to that play so much i wasn't in that play i was in riders to sea which was another tragedy but anyway um i bring you flowers if you have the opportunity and you like to read plays read that one act play it doesn't take a lot of time it's a one act play so it doesn't take a lot of time a lot of energy but read that play it's so good um but i was in riders to sea and uh, so somebody who was in I Bring You Flowers was the main lead in that. She got cast actually in The Diary of Anne Frank as Anne Frank. And so she couldn't do that anymore. She got cast as that in another theater. And so the girl who played my role in Riders of the Sea initially was moved to that role. And I got a phone call like seven o'clock in the morning from the director of that play. And I was so excited because he had offered me that part instead of the other one. And it was really fun, but the most stressful part of it was we were so far along at that point that I had to be off book in a week. And it's a one act play, so I mean, it, again, it's shorter, but that was stressful. Plus I had to learn a, a different accent because I had to do it in an Irish accent, so 
that was also very stressful. <laughs> that play didn't come with a lot of negative at all. The only thing that really came from that one was the woman, who, the girl who played my mother in that play. So Kathleen, the character that I played, was kind of this uh, ignored child. She was she was ignored by the mother. She wasn't cared for by the mother. She was very neglected. It's a tragedy, okay? Anyway, just so happened that that was actually the relationship that I had with that girl. And I wanted so desperately for this, she was like a senior at the time, I wanted so desperately for her to like me because I was in that mindset still of, of, of having this need for people to like me and have people to accept me and people to be appreciative of me, um, that I really struggled doing that play a lot because of the fact that I couldn't get her to like me. Um, I tried so hard and for years I tried to get her to like me and so that was tough. That was always really tough. But Rise of Sea it all in all was a very pleasant experience for me. I still have stuff from it. I have the, I have some netting from it. I have like from like just stuff on the sets. I still have netting from it. I think I still have this foam um, like thing that was supposed to be put into the fire that I stole from when we were striking the set. Um, I still have a newspaper clipping from when we were in the newspaper because of it and my picture is part of that. I'll post that picture here. And it was just, it was a very pleasant experience all in all. Uh, I'm still friends with a couple people that are on that, that were on that play, that were in that play. Um, I don't say great contact with any of them. The only one is the guy in the middle in that picture. He and I are still in somewhat decent contact. The next play I did was actually one where I was in the background for, and I don't remember what play it was. It was a show. I don't remember what show it was now. I don't even remember the name of it, but I did props for that for that show. So I was in one of the wings, running the prop table, making sure that people were grabbing the correct props and only the actors who were supposed to be touching those props were touching their props. Um, because that is that is a very important job. It is genuinely, I'm not saying that sarc sarcastically, prop work is very, very important and very, very essential because if you cannot, if you, if somebody else touches a prop and moves it someplace that they're not supposed to, then things will go bad very quickly. So I was in charge of one of the prop tables and that's where I met the guy that I ended up having a crush on for the majority of my high school career. And um, he was a jerk. <laughs> he was actually just this terrible person to me. And so how I developed a crush on him, I'm probably just a masochist at the end of the day. So there's that. No, we actually did develop a friendship in another play later, but he was a jerk. He was a jerk and I did not like him. Um, I thought he was a horrible person. And then thinking back to how he broke my heart, yeah, he's probably just a terrible person. That was the first time I had, 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 I had ever experienced doing um, a play or a show in the background, in the crew versus an actual cast member. Um, and I didn't like it as much, but I've definitely experienced cast membership more later on. Um, or I have definitely done crew a lot, uh, but uh, it's just, it's not something that I genuinely enjoy. I just, I like acting. That's what I like doing or directing. If I'm going to do crew, I want to do the directing portion of it. I want to do something artistic. I don't want to just stand there and press buttons or stand there and say that prop, you know, more power to the people who do want to do that. They are the people who make the play run or the show run. So I am not saying that, that is not okay or not good are not important jobs. They are all very important. It's just not one of the jobs that I personally prefer. Moving on. So the next play I did was Oh What a Tangled Web. It was another one act play. We did that in sequence to a one act abridged version of <laughs> Taming of the Shrew. How they were able to make Taming of the Shrew an abridged one act version is beyond me, but somehow it worked and it was, it was good. Anyway, um, so I was in Ta Oh What a Tangled Web, which was a contemporary uh, kind of set in the 80s play uh, about um, just a series of misunderstandings, comedic misunderstandings. And it was actually kind of a really funny play. I don't think we have it on tape, unfortunately. If I have it on tape, I'm going to try and find it. And I'm going to try. I know I have Riders, Riders of the Sea on tape. And I know I have Cinderella on tape. I don't know if I have a Tangled Web on tape. I hope I do because that I still have the script. Um, but, and it would be fun to get some of my actor friends together and we could maybe do a dramatic reading of it. Who knows? But, oh my goodness. <laughs> I 
loved that play. <laughs> I played like this woman from a shelter or something and they were trying to adopt a dog after losing their dog. I don't remember much of it anymore, but it just was a bunch of comedic misunderstandings and it was absolutely beautiful and fantastic and I loved doing that play. That was the one where I ended up being uh, becoming friends with the guy that I had developed this crush on. It's actually how I developed my crush on him. I was a sophomore in high school at the time when we did that play and I really kind of started to like him. One of the really funny things was we actually used one of my outfits, which I don't know why I had that outfit, but I did have that outfit and it was like this business casual thing that I had. Um, I never wore it except for that play. <laughs> Maybe we bought it for the play, I don't remember, but it was my outfit. And so I forgot it one day. I brought it home to wash it and I forgot it at home. I lived 30 minutes away from my high school. So um, I got there and back in 20. Don't tell my mom, she doesn't watch my videos. <laughs> um, anyway, she's in the house right now. So there's that. I um, am not proud of that. Don't ever do that. Don't do that ever. But I made it back. I made it there and I made it home and back in 20 minutes. How I was not stopped by a police officer is beyond me, but somehow I made it happen. Um, but yeah, so there's that. Again, this one doesn't come with a lot of weirdness. The only thing that really happened was when I had developed this crush on this guy, now mind you, I'm not a comedic actor. I've never been a comedic actor and I was in a comedy. So I look back at this and think, wow, what a jerk thing to say. Why did I develop a crush on him? But at the same time, like, I'm not a comedic actor. <laughs> but one day, the guy that I developed the crush on decided to proceed to tell me that I was a terrible actor. Um, now mind you, again, I'm not a comedic actor, so I'm not good at comedy. I've never been very good at comedy. I like to pretend I'm good at comedy. I'm not. Um, I, I like to edit myself in such a way that I hope people laugh. I make myself laugh. I make my family laugh. But I think if you have to know me in order to think I'm funny. Um, so there's that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he called me a terrible actor once. And I thought he was kidding. I realized later that he wasn't. And I was like, wow, he's a jerk. But this was after I had already been disconnected from my crush from him. So, because he could do no wrong in my head when I had, when I had that crush on him. So there's that. But yeah, so that's really the only story that I have from there that was kind of a horror story per se. Because again, that experience was just very, very fun. Um, this was a different director than I had before. Um, this was the third director I'd worked, for, worked with because in Cinderella, I worked with one director and then in um Tang in uh, Riders of Sea I worked with the like lead guy who did most of the directing when I was there he's not there anymore and then this one was somebody else that took over for him um for pretty much the not the rest I guess but for a couple of years she took over um but not the rest of my high school life because he came back later on which that guy that guy one thing I forgot to share was the night that he hosted a sleepover at his house for the cast of Riders of Sea. And, uh, and uh, I bring you flowers. So just a bunch of high school girls and boys sleeping over at a teacher's house. We were also invited to his wedding. And I went to his wedding. It's a very beautiful wedding. Anyway, moving on. The next one was uh, Young Lady of Property. So Young Lady of Property is where I had the worst case of uh, I hate my life syndrome, whatever you may want to call that, when it came to acting. It was actually where I lost a little bit of interest in acting for a hot second because I was so astounded at what had happened that I was so, and I was so disgusted by what had happened. And even the explanation didn't make any sense at all. So Young Lady Property is a very long one act play. So we didn't put on a second play. Uh, we just did Young Lady of Property. 
And so Young Lady of Property is a weird play. And so we did that during the fall because we were going to do the one act competition, but turned out it was too long to do the one act competition. So we ended up not doing the one act competition. I don't remember the specifics of it anymore. But the cast list came out and I wasn't on it, which I mean, is fine. When you're an actor, it's whatever. But who ended up being on that casting list was actually one of my abusers. Um, that story time has also been done on this channel. And if I don't have enough cards at this point, I'll link it at the end of the video. But um, my abuser was actually cast in that play. And I don't think that director understood, even I at the time didn't understand what I was going through in that very toxic friendship that I was had that I had with this girl. I didn't understand that until after the whole first half of the geek con story took place. I really didn't understand just how toxic she was as a friend and looking back, our friendship was nothing but just plain abuse. And um, hi, if you're watching this, because you know who you are. Um, we have talked since then. We have talked actually relatively recently, as close to like two years ago, we've spoken and I told you exactly how I feel about you. So, um, so I had to endure her toxic behavior, her toxic ass of, I'm just a better actor than you. When this was like the first play she'd ever done and she's not a good actor because when I talked to the director, cause I did, I sat down with the director and I go, how could you cast her over me? Not to be a diva, just genuinely wondering why she cast this girl over me. Casting my best friend in that other role, perfectly fine. But can you imagine since they were best friends in the show or in the, in the play, they were best friends in the play, wouldn't it make sense to cast the two actual best friends so they had best friend chemistry? Nikki hated this other girl. <laughs> But Nikki's a good actor, so like Nikki was able to pull it off just fine. But you know, it just it was weird. Um, I still have her script. <laughs> I stole Nikki's script at some point. She stole somebody else's script at some point. I don't know. We both. I have two scripts for Young Lady of Property. She has one, and she claims one she has is hers. But I I know the one I have is hers because it has her handwriting in it. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe she got a second script at some point. But anyway. Um, I was heavily involved in that because I was the assistant director. Um, so I was heavily involved in the play itself. I helped direct some of the some of the scenes. I was in charge of being on script in the backstage on backstage on one of the sides of the wings in one of the wings because I um, need to make sure that everything was running properly. I also made I also manned that prop table as well because we just didn't have enough people to have a separate person to do props on that side. So I ran that um, myself. Actually, somebody that I did Cinderella with was over on the other side running that prop table and being on script on that side. And uh, then on opening night, the I'll get back to the whole other story in just a second. Opening night, the director comes up to me and throws three dresses at me and she says, put these on. And I said, why? And she goes, because now you're in the show. And I was like, what? So I had to learn like one scene. I was only in one scene. I had to learn that one scene very quickly. And then I had to be in makeup, hair and costume, um, also doing my assistant director job. So thanks, Lindsay, for backing out of the play randomly on opening night. Okay, so back to my abuser story. As you can tell, I like to avoid these conversations because these are really hard for me. Um, but yeah, so I had to endure all of the all of this crap at the lunch table everywhere, every class we had together. How much better she was than me because she was cast in her first play as a lead role and she was cast over me. The person in my class, and she was a year older, but still, a cla my class known as one of like the actors of that graduating class. It was me and uh, a girl named Heather, my friend Nikki, and Jake, the guy that I had the crush on during Cinderella. We were like the actors of our graduating class and I, I wasn't in the show, she was. So she was obviously just so much better than me. And dealing with that was hard enough as well as having to deal with the fact that I didn't get in dealing with the fact that I was having to do this assistant director job and dealing with her attitude while being the assistant director. And it was really hard. So finally at one point I went to the director and I said, what the heck? 
why? And she goes, literally because of her personality. <laughs> she goes, she's a terrible actor. You have to remember that. She's terrible. But she has the same kind of personality that the, that the character has. So it just made better sense. She goes, you've got a lot more dominate, domineering personality, dominating personality. So I wanted to, it was, so it was between you and Nikki for this other role. And I just, I couldn't cast either one of you as the other one. And at the end of the day, I just liked Nikki's audition a little bit better. And I was like, that's fair. That's fine. Whatever. Nikki can be cast. Like, I'm not jealous of Nikki. Nikki is a great actor. Um, she's, she's so good at it. She loves doing it just as much as I do. And I want to see her succeed in anything she chooses to do. But this other girl, being cast, be, having her being cast over me was, was very difficult because I knew she wasn't a good, a good actor. I was there for her audition. She's terrible. And she, honestly, the play was, I mean, it was a very poor decision still to this day. I still believe it was a very poor decision. I do not have any young lady of property um, that I know of on tape, but um, that exists in my memory. And then there was Emma. That following spring, we did the, our spring production, which we chose to do Emma, the play version of Jane Austen's novel. And I was cast as Miss Bates. To this day, my favorite role I've ever done. Loved it. There are very few bad stories from Emma. Emma was genuinely one of my favorite things I've ever done. I actually almost auditioned for it again a few years ago. Um, and I wanted to audition for Miss Bates because I probably would actually fit the age now that Miss Bates would be roughly because she's supposed to be middle aged. Um, I would love to play Miss Bates again because oh my god what a fun role. This one I know I don't have any it footage of. Um, this one I've got some behind the scenes footage of if I could ever find it. Uh, I would love to do that. I've got some behind the scenes stuff where me and the actors were just kind of, me and the other actors were just kind of messing around. Um, that was a fun, that was a fun production. And what was really fun was the guy that I had the crush on, he actually came to me later and he go, and he actually admitted that he was wrong. That I was actually a really good actor. I was just in the wrong part in Tangled Web. And I think that's what made me really start to fall for him even more was having him say that. Um, yeah, that was, that was fun. We had this foreign exchange student. She and I are still friends. I love her. Um, she was from Indonesia. She was just this little ball of energy. She was so fantastic. Jenny, oh my goodness, I miss you with all of my heart. She like lives in Colorado now, I think, but she was from Indonesia. And so when the, when the, when the, um, tsunami hit Indonesia back when I was a senior in high school, like everybody would come to me and Nikki, how's Jenny, how's Jenny? Cause they know, they knew that we stayed in contact with her and we hadn't heard from her in weeks. We eventually finally heard from her. We let the school know, the school announced that Jenny was fine, blah, blah, blah. She had actually moved to Colorado at that point. So she wasn't actually in Indonesia when that happened. Um, but she was just this little ball of energy and she played Mrs. Bates, my mother. She and I had so much fun, so much fun. Um, Nikki was in that play. I, I don't remember if she was in the crew or in the cast anymore, but basically everybody that I loved in the theater department at my high school was in that play. And we just had a ball. We just had so much fun. And we just, I don't know, that play was so much fun. Um, again, I don't have any negatives that came from that particular play. And if I do, they have all been blocked out for my PTSD, so they must be pretty fucking dramatic. But that was a fun play. So no real stories from that, but the next one, Solid Gold Cadillac. I love the play. Hated my experience on it. So Nikki was cast in the main role, which obviously it that role was made for Nikki, I swear. Like that is the perfect role for Nikki because Nikki has a very similar personality. I'm sorry, <laughs> you do. <laughs> I love you, but you do. Anyway, um, and I was cast as a news reporter for that particular play, um, even though I should have gotten the narrator position and the narrator role. Um, 
and it's so funny because even the director said so so it was the director the main head director so the other the lady took over for a couple years this director was now back this was my senior year of high school um and even the director himself outright said yeah you were actually my front runner for that role and then this fat phobic asshole decided to then say but I just wanted somebody thinner for the role. Should you not? So that made me livid. I yelled at him. We had a screaming match backstage where everybody could hear it. And I was so angry about it because how dare you? I mean, I get it. There are some roles that do require smaller statures. Glass Menagerie, the lead, a the lead character, the lead actress, needs to have a smaller stature. It is written into the script, is written into the actual character design itself. There are roles where that is important. The narrator, not important to have a specific stature. What was important was the ability to over-exaggerate and to be able to tell a proper story. That's it. That's it. To make the story engaging, that's literally the role of a narrator in a play or a show. Um, this narrator, it did not indicate any kind of gender, it did not indicate any kind of size, any kind of stature, any kind of, of ethnicity. It was open to literally anybody. And yet the director had it in his head that he wanted somebody thinner. And so he cast somebody who I sat there going, she's not even doing what the script is asking her to do. Because the role itself, let me wind down here a second, because the role itself is like, requires you to be big and tell the story and do it like this and be out there and overact and it's meant to be like that because it's a stupid story. I mean, it's a great story, don't get me wrong. It's a fantastic story, I did a whole, um, I did a whole production, and not that we ever actually put it on, but I did a whole production design for it in college, my freshman year of college, because I loved the play so much that I have still to this day dreams of putting it on again in my in my image, which I would love to do, and I, I would have to see if Nikki would be willing to play the lead role again because. She's the only one who can play that role in my head. Anyway, um, but she wasn't like that. She would get on stage and she would be giving a speech. <laughs> and I was so frustrated. And again, it was one of those situations where I went to the director and I was like, why? And that's when he told me, because you're a little thicker than what I imagined the role to be, were his literal words to me. You're a little thicker than I imagined the, the role to be. And he goes, you're never going to make it anywhere as an actor being as thick as you are. Well, that's his opinion. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, he was, a, he was a piece of work, that dude. So that was really the only real story from that one because I blocked that one pretty much out of my head as well. Um, I did my role. I never spoke to the man ever again. Um, except for one night we did this theater get together night. It was like a little dinner that the school put on for the theater department at the end of that year. And he gave me Twelfth Night. He, what he did was he found Shakespeare plays that he felt like um, matched specific um, people. So Nikki got one, Jake Watt got one, Heather got one, um, a few other seniors I'm assuming got one as well. I don't remember anymore who was all there that were seniors. Those are the only ones that stick out to me because those are the ones that I worked with the most. And so he gave me Twelfth Night, which, I mean, truth be told, I get. <laughs> if you guys don't know anything about Twelfth Night, if you've ever seen the movie She's the Man, that's Twelfth Night. Um, uh, she's the Man starring Amanda Bynes from like the end of the aughts. Uh, I can't remember exactly when it came out anymore, but that's, that's a retelling, a modern retelling of Twelfth Night. Um, it's about a girl who dress, cross dresses, and I get it. <laughs> I'm a very manly woman. Uh, though it's not my favorite Shakespeare play, I was kind of disappointed. I was like, I wanted much ado about nothing, but I don't match a sex comedy, so. But yeah, so I still have that play somewhere. I don't know where it is anymore. I was so traumatized by him. 
um, my senior year of high school because of that conversation, it really affected the rest of my high school, the rest of that year. I was gonna say the rest of my high school career, literally a few months. Um, it really affected my high school life after that because uh, I was already feeling really crappy about myself because I'd already been severely bullied for my weight and um, I was struggling with, eat with binge eating disorder and I couldn't um, seem to understand what that was. I had already been diagnosed at that point with binge eating disorder, but I couldn't seem to overcome it. I couldn't understand how to fix it. Nobody was there to help me. And now to go to somebody who I had a lot of respect for and a lot of trust with, somebody that I trusted a lot with over the many years that I had known him, since eighth grade, I have known that man. I have worked diligently with that man since eighth grade. And now a senior in high school, and he just turned into one of the very same bullies that I had dealt with all of my life about my weight. And so I was very heavily traumatized, so I actually don't know where that play is anymore. Um, it is somewhere. He signed it too, I think. Like he left a little note in it. I'll find it eventually and, and display it proudly because I am, for the most part, over all of that. It's still something that does stick with me though because I, as a director, whenever I've worked with teenagers, I have always made sure, just like I said about Cinderella, I have always made sure to be very honest and open and to be very understanding and cognizant of what they might be going through. And I would never. Even if that was the case, like if it was a case of the glass menagerie and a person with a larger body came to me and said, why wasn't I cast in, the, in that role? I can, I, then I would probably very kindly place that information in them being like, well, unfortunately because of her condition, she is supposed to be of a very skeletal structure. And unfortunately, you, there isn't a place for body positivity in that role. And I wish there was, I wish there was something that I could do where that's concerned, but the script calls for a very skeletal structure. And unfortunately in a larger body, you can't have that kind of role, but I think you did fantastic. And honestly, if the script hadn't called for it, I would have cast you in that role as long as I would have, you know, I wouldn't lie, but I have always tried very hard, not that I've ever direct, directed Glass Menagerie, I haven't, but um, I would love to, that's a great play. Um, at the same time, I have very much always tried when I've worked with teenagers in a theater setting, I have always been very adamant about making sure that they feel like they're in a safe place because I was never given that freedom. I have never been given that, that ability to feel safe. And that sucks. That's unfortunate. Um, after that was college, and that was a whole slew of different issues. I had one director. I was I was I did lights for Macbeth, which wasn't an acting story, uh, but that one in particular. That was another one where I went to the director. I went to that. He was one of my professors, and I went to him. He was also the professor that called me a liar to my face when I didn't lie, and and I proved it to him that I didn't lie. Like I physically proved it anyway. He was a messed up individual. He and I never stayed in contact after I, after I left Michigan State University. But anyway, um, I went to him and I asked why I wasn't cast because I wanted to know. I mean, it's okay to go to the director as long as you've got some kind of working relationship with that person and ask that question, why wasn't I cast? What can I do to do better? What can I work on? Um, it's, it's very important and it's actually very, very okay to do. Um, and his response was exactly what I had, what I have already kind of accepted in my life. I can't do Shakespeare. <laughs> can't. I can't do Shakespeare. I can read it. I can understand it. I love Shakespeare. I cannot act Shakespeare. I can't do it. I understand it. I can read it just fine. I don't have this ability to just up and do the iambic pentameter. I know you do it in natural speaking tonality as well, but when I'm trying to do Shakespeare, when you're trying to speak that language and you are also having to do an iambic pentameter, it, I, 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 I don't have that ability naturally. Like, I just can't do it. And he was the first person to just outright tell me that. You just can't do Shakespeare. <laughs> He's like, I will gladly cast you in literally anything else. He goes, you can't do Shakespeare. <laughs> Which I laugh at because it wasn't really that traumatic because I had already kind of understood that I couldn't do Shakespeare. I struggled. So, I struggle so hard 
speaking Shakespeare, speaking Shakespearean. Because um, he has a whole different language, a whole different way of speaking, a whole different ex experience in your brain. Um, and it, it's not easy, my friend. It's not easy. And the next play I did, in, or the next show I did, which was a um, uh, funny thing happened in the way to the Forum, which I love Stephen Sondheim. He's my favorite, 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 favorite um, musical person. Um, love him. Love him. So much. As much as I love Arthur Miller, Arthur Miller is my favorite playwright. Stephen Sondheim is my favorite musical show creator. Um, anyway, so funny thing happened the way of the forum. I was uh, one of the extras in the back, essentially, but I was specifically cast as an Amazon because they had they had taken the like chorus and they'd split them up into different pieces of the of different like aspects of the show. So I was cast as cast as an Amazon. And I actually got to do the makeup design for our group as well, which I thought was really fun. Um, but that was full of a lot of crap. And that was one of the things that actually really pushed me to transfer to St. Cloud State University. So St. Bemidji State University was because that director was a horrible bitch. I actually caught the flu at one point and I had this one person in my, in the cast, she was one of the other Amazons and she goes, just think I'm not getting sick because you can't get sick. I'm not getting sick. I'm not getting sick. I'm not getting sick. I'm like, bitch, I'm already sick. And so I ended up not being able to go to rehearsal for like an entire week because I was bedridden. I had a fever. When I get the flu, that's the only time I ever get sick is when I get the flu. And so if I get sick, just know if I'm like bleh, sick, not like throw up sick, but like if I ever get like sick, sick, that's because I have the flu. Um, and so I had the flu. I was bedridden. I was iller than heck. I had a fever. I wanted to die. My RA actually came into my room one that one time to check on me and she was like, just admit it. You're hungover. And I was like, as a joke. And I'm like, cause I'm not, I even in high, even in college, I was never much of a party person. And she knew that and she's like, just admit it. It's a hangover. And I was like, you caught me. It's a hangover. I actually hadn't even had my first hangover yet. I hadn't been drunk yet in my entire life at that point. Um, and uh, she laughed and she goes, how are you feeling? And I said, I feel like shit. Right after she had left, the director called me and said, I don't know if theater is the right place for you if you're not going to show up to rehearsals. And I go, okay, I am sick, sicker than a dog. Do you really want me to show up when I don't have much of a voice, when I have a fever? when I should be resting and you want me to be going there? She goes, you obviously just don't have the, the dedication that it takes to do theater. There was also this dance sequence that we had to do. Um, I thought it would stick with me forever because of how traumatic it was to have to learn, but I don't remember it anymore. I think if I think if the other two were with me and either one of them remembered and they started doing it, I would be able to pick it up again really quickly. But there was this dance sequence that we created ourselves and I had the hardest time getting it down and the girl who was like, just, you're not getting sick, just think happy thoughts, you're not getting sick. Um, the same girl that did that crap to me during that, um, she, um, She was the one who was like screaming at me because I wasn't getting it. And I'm like, I, I'm sorry I'm not getting it. Like, anyway, but the, her problem was is that we should have been doing it a lot sooner than we actually did. Unfortunately, we were doing it like three days before we opened because I don't know why. <laughs> so those are the two big stories there. But one of the good things that came from that was my friendship with Sarah Bull. You guys know my friendship with Sarah Bull. Um, she doesn't really do YouTube videos anymore. I wish she still did. YouTube videos. Sarah, if you're watching this, please upload more because I love you and you're amazing and you're my favorite human being. I'm one of my favorite human beings, you know that. Um, your babies are cute. She just had another baby. You guys are unaware. She has two kids now with her husband and she's fantastic. Her name is not Sarah Bull anymore, but I will always call her Sarah Bull. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I had known her prior to that. We had known each other because we were both in the theater department, but that show was where we were able to really become friends 
and I adore her. Like, I adored everybody that I knew in Bemidji except for the professors. Like, that theater department was so toxic for me, and I'm so glad I transferred because the film department at St. Cloud State University was, like, my home. Like, I felt so good there. Even going back, like, I was accepted back with, well, I was accepted back with open arms except for one professor. <laughs> Not that there was anything bad, but he didn't, and I just never interacted with one another while I was there uh, when I went back to finally finish. But like my old advisor, like just scooped me up and was my advisor again. And I would stop in his office frequently while I was there weekly and just hang out with him and chat with him. Um, you guys saw the picture when I graduated, when I graduated when he was there and he was just so proud of the fact that I finally came back to finish and graduate and I'm going to cry because I love him so much. I have his book that he wrote um, because he's such an incredible human and I adore that man so much. He's such a fantastic human being. Uh, and the new, you know, production professor, he was so wonderful. I love any professor that starts a class with, hi, what's your name and your preferred pronouns. Like, I love that um, about him. And he and I had a lot of really fun conversations about Russia. Because <laughs> I'm Polish. <laughs> but I asked him where from Russia he, where, where in Russia he was from, because he was going back to Russia um, for a year. He went on a sabbatical that next semester. And uh, he went back to Russia to visit family. And obviously, I'm sure he probably got stuck in Russia, but uh, for a long time, but he, um, he and I talked, he's actually not anywhere from near Poland at all, but I was like, cause my family's from, I have, I have part of my family is from Poland. And, um, so obviously I'm, I'm familiar with that kind of area. And he, and I had a lot of really good conversations, but I felt so at home when I went to, when I went to St. Cloud. I still did theater in St. Cloud, obviously. Um, and my only real weird stories were the times that I was where I, I was very close to calling sexual harassment a couple of times. There was one play that I did, and again, this one I have on, this one I have on film. Um, this one, not film, it's actually on a DVD, so this one I would very easily be able to react to some of my scenes from. But one of the people in that play would constantly, like, touch me. Not inappropriately, but, like, he would always have his hand on me, which is really weird, because it's a small world. I went to high school with his daughter, which is really weird, because we didn't know each other, because she didn't live with him. She lived with her uncle and her aunt and uncle when we went to high school together. And so I didn't know him and I didn't realize that was his daughter. And we actually ran into each other at, at St. Claus University. We took a class together in her, uh, completely by accident right, and kind of reconnected our friendship. Um, and we're still friends uh, somewhat to this day. I mean, more acquaintances than anything, but um, her dad just kept like touching me. And, sh and he knew who I was at that point. And he would just like keep touching me. He'd like poke me. He'd like touch me with his foot. And I finally got to point, please stop. And he did. Luckily, he did not continue to touch me after that. But I asked him to please stop. And he did, which I was very happy about. Then there was a director that I had. <laughs> Who, he was one of the hardest people to work with ever. He was very difficult to work with. He was... Um, and mind you, there's a reason I'm not saying anything about the name of this particular play because I don't want him to ever come across this video and know that this was him. Um, cause I, I felt so uncomfortable that I never even told him to stop, but he would constantly make remarks to me, very un, very inappropriate remarks. And I mean, I was dating somebody at the time and I was dating, I mean, you guys know that story. I was dating this linebacker at this time and, and if I really felt uncomfortable, I would have said something to him. He would have come and set this guy straight. <laughs> but I also was a competitive fighter at the time. So like if he had tried anything physical, I would have taken him out. So I was not, I felt uncomfortable, but not to the point that I need, felt like I needed there to be any kind of saving per se. Um, but yeah, he made me just really comfortable. He kept making weird remarks to me. Um, and then he would also just be really difficult to work with. You know, he had us supplying our own costumes because again, it was a contemporary play. So we were we, we would just bring our own costumes for this particular play. And he would constantly tell me that what I was bringing was not good enough. And we're like, then supply costumes. Then budget costumes and supply them. If everything I choose to bring in is not okay, 
then supply costumes. And he said, no, you need to get this right. And he was just very difficult to work with. He had a very specific idea of what my role should have been, what my role should have looked like, um, because I was playing a very prim and proper prissy person. And so he just had this very specific idea of what I should look like and how I should dress and how I should act. And, and he was just very, very difficult to work with. And I feel like, and if you ask any of the people that I've worked with in the past, as far as directors that I've worked with in the past, you would probably hear that I'm very easy to work with. I'm very, uh, I don't fight back a lot. If you ask me to do something different, I will do it 100% differently. Um, I'm not difficult to work with, but this guy was so difficult to work with that I, I had no choice but to start pushing back on him because it, he was asking me impossible things, essentially, without taking any kind of accountability. So that's really it. I really don't have any horror stories from after I was out of school, any kind of uh, production I've done. Most of it's been voiceover since I left school um, and a lot of it is very personal. I'm at my I'm myself. The only one that I really have was a show that or was a was a movie that I was actually uncast from. I was fired from uh, relatively recently. It was a couple of years ago um, and that was because I on Twitter decided to call her out on ableism and she fought me back saying it's not ableism and I said I have every right to say it is because it's against dyslexia and because uh, one of my worst, one of my biggest things that I absolutely hate as somebody who is dyslexic, somebody who chooses not to read for fun because reading is difficult for me, um, reading is not recreational for me, um, is when people say that in order to be smart you have to read. I'm a very intelligent person and I do read, but I read for educational purposes and not for anything else, but I also learn a lot from seeing and doing. I learn better from seeing and doing. I learn better from um, being taught, physically taught how to do something, or being physically or being explained to me verbally. I, I learn a lot better that way. I'm a very intelligent person, um, but I have dyslexia, and so reading is a lot of work. And I was diagnosed very late in life. I was di not very late in life, but I was diagnosed at 16, which is a lot later than you want to be diagnosed with dyslexia. So I struggle with dyslexia to this day in my 30s, even though if I had been diagnosed a lot sooner, I probably wouldn't um, experience that as much. Um, I wouldn't experience the same hardships that I do to this day. And so she had said something on Twitter that I called out. I said, hey, FYI, this is really ableist against people with, with learning disabilities like dyslexia, like myself. And she fought back saying, it's not, it's not. Why is everybody so, you know, sensitive these days? I'm like, it's not me being sensitive. It's me saying, hey, maybe you don't say this. And so she messaged me and said, by the way, I've, I have removed you from the production. So that's really it. Um, I don't even remember the name of that movie anymore. It, had, it was like an Alice in Wonderland kind of, of movie. And I hope it did well. I don't know. Uh, but I was uncast from it because I called out the director on being ableist. I mean, maybe that was a mistake on my part, but I'm also going to be somebody who, when I am choosing be to be an activist, I'm going to be an activist. I'm going to stand up for my learning disability. I'm going to stand up for any neurodivergent person. Dyslexia is considered neurodivergency um, on a different level than, than ADHD and obviously autism. But at the same time, it is still something I'm going to stand up for. I'm going to stand up for any neurodivergency. I'm going to stand up for the LGBTQ community if I see anything negative there. I'm going to stand up for people of color. I'm going to stand up for women. I'm going to stand up for people in larger bodies. Like that is what I choose to be active, uh, you know, an activist for. And um, I don't care if it costs me my job. <laughs> I genuinely don't. Um, I'm going to stand up for injustice wherever I see it. And uh, I am okay with having lost that job. It wasn't going to make or break my career. So I'm okay with having lost that job because I just decided to take a stand against something that I found to be not okay to say. And I'm okay with losing my job for that. So that, ladies and gentlemen, are all the reasons why I drink due to acting. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If there's any other, if you really, if you like my wine story times, please let me know with hitting the like button down below. I would love to see how many likes I can get on this video. So let's see if I can do that. Please share this video. 
with an actor you may know and see if there are any similarities between stories that I have and stories that they have. If you are an actor, please let me know your acting horror stories down in the comments below. Um, hit the bell for notifications after you subscribe to this channel. If you guys want to see the last story time I did, you can click here. I'm going to go ahead and regardless put the story time of the friend that I almost sued, the same friend I talked about that was uh, one of my main abusers in high school. I'll click that right, I'll put that video right here as well. Click here to subscribe to my vlogging channel where I'm a pet parent. Click here to subscribe to this channel. Like I said, hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss a single one of my videos. Comment your acting horror stories or if you're creative any of any type, put horror stories down below of your experience within the creative world because they come with a lot of highs but also a lot of lows. So put those in the comments below. Like this video if you liked it. Share this video with another, like I said, another creative or another actor or a director. Please share this video and let others know that this channel is here and this channel is telling fun stories and, tell and talking about acting. Um, and I'll see you guys all next time. Bye.